I don't remember, uh, not only do I not remember when I first wanted to be a pilot and fly airplanes, but my mom used to say that she, she can't remember when, or she used to say that I, she couldn't remember when, when I ever wanted to do anything other than be a pilot, you know, consistently. Of course, there were days when I was one to be a cowboy or be a John Wayne on Iwo Jima and, and uh, things uh, of that nature, but, but uh, the overwhelming dominant thing was to be a pilot. And uh, uh, my older sister, who was about 10 years older than I, uh, was kind of influential in that. She, she would help build, she would actually build at first the model airplanes, you know, the stick and paper tissue uh, airplanes, and, and uh, help me get started flying them. In fact, the first airplane I had was a, she had cut it out of a tin can, a can of, I think it was an old can of beans or something, and she, took the can and shaped an airplane and and it had very sharp edges on it and of course at, at the age that I was at then my mom didn't want me to play with that she was afraid I'd hurt myself so maybe there's a little bit of not being able to have what I really wanted uh, that, that started that desire <laughs> but I don't think so I think I just always wanted to fly airplanes well that's interesting that your sister was building model airplanes did she do anything professionally no she she was a teacher she uh, she taught home economics uh, in a high school, and uh, uh, she uh, was a farm wife. She married a, a farmer who lived right outside town and raised a great family. And uh, no, she never had any interest in airplanes. She just would help me, and I thought that was really neat. Well, did, did her pilot brother ever take her flying? <laughs> yeah, yes I did. Uh, I guess uh, when I was uh, work in college and working at, uh, during the summers at Cessna, I, was able to fly in the Session Employees Flying Club and I would bring an airplane up home and, and uh, took Betty up one time. Well, I get the feeling that when you went to, to the University of Kansas, you weren't one of those guys that waited till his sophomore year to declare a major. You, <laughs> you uh, went right for aeronautical engineering and tell me a little bit about your educational experience. Well, uh, that's quite right, quite true. And, and in fact, one other thing about the childhood that I remember so distinctly is uh, you couldn't go down to the store and buy, you know, toys, cockpits, things like that, uh, simulator games and things. You, uh, I, uh, I remember so vividly. We had, we lived on a sandy area uh, in uh, at the edge of town, and I would I would dig a cockpit down into the sand, and I remember very distinctly uh, stuffing cans, old uh, vegetable cans, in the instrument panel for the for the round gauges. And those were very realistic to me at the time. I could see the needles going around, and um, and I had got off the right sticks for the for the control stick and the throttle. And what age are you then, Joe? Oh golly, I would guess maybe five, six. Long now, I hadn't started school yet. I know. What? How does a? I, I'm sorry for going down this road, but how does a <laughs> five or six year old understand what what the the uh, the panel of the inside of an airplane looks like? Well. Um, I was able to get a hold of a couple of Air Trails magazines and, and uh, I forget what the other one, Skyways and Air Trails I think were the two um, airplane magazines during that time frame and uh, they had pictures in them and, and uh, after I was in school I think uh, shortly after I started school I went, uh, went to a movie and it was about uh, bush, bush plane flying in Alaska so that was that was one of my goals was to be a, a float fly a float plane back into those little lakes in Alaska. But the overwhelming thing I wanted to do was to be a flying tiger pilot, and you know, fly P-40s and shoot down Jap Zeros. Just really wanted. In fact, I can remember so distinctly when VJ Day came. Um, I, I got to be one of the kids in town. There weren't that many kids in Chapman anyway, but I got to be one of the kids to go down to the old Methodist Church and, and ring the bell. For the town to you know was celebrating and i i really had misgivings about ringing that bell because it to me it was just kind of sealing the tomb that I, I would never get to shoot down jap zeros in a p-40 and i'm guessing you had a, a few interesting conversations with tex hill in your life absolutely yeah what absolutely a what a man tex and i were very good friends we we hunted together. Uh, we didn't ever fly together, although Tex would show up at the Confederate Air Force, uh, which is now Commemorative Air Force, functions, and we had a lot of fun there. And we, we were friends, good friends, right up 
right up till the end. Uh, we went over to see Tex uh, the weekend before he passed on and just had a wonderful conversation with him. There wasn't a day you were sitting in the Kansas field and saw a guy up there and thought he was better off, or was it the movie? There wasn't a moment when you said, man, airplanes. You, you don't remember a oh, there wasn't company a, like that. There wasn't a single moment. There were continued moments, and in fact, your, your example is right, right on. I can remember distinctly when I was uh, in high school, or just started high school, or maybe I was still in grade school, I worked during the summers um, out on what became my brother-in-law's farm and uh, harvest time for wheat. Uh, before they'd run the combine through, I, there were always draws in, in, in the field and uh, sunflowers would tend to grow there because water collected there. And, and uh, of course sunflowers, if you run the combine through them, they, they increase the foreign, foreign count in the wheat and it lowers your, your, uh, what you get for the wheat. So uh, just before cutting a field, I would be handed a corn knife, a big corn knife, like a machete, and go out and cut sunflowers down so that the combine wouldn't pick them up. And I can remember out there sweating and cussing on the end of that corn knife, looking up and seeing somebody flying over in an airplane thinking, yeah, it's got to be more fun than what I'm doing here. And so even though my dad was a vocational ag teacher at in high school at where I went to high school. And I know he would have been very proud if I'd have been a farmer, but uh, I had decided that long before that that I wanted to be a pilot. Uh, even though he was a, an ag teacher, did being raised by a, by a teacher have uh, its advantages? Uh, it, it certainly did. I don't think directly as far as being given any special privileges in school. In fact, I think if anything that, that meant that I had to, I was held to a little higher um, standards than, than uh, I might have been otherwise. Or at least I kind of felt that I should be because Dad was, Dad was a vocational ag teacher. But, but no, my mother was an a elementary school teacher for a while until she got married. And uh, I, think, I think the influence of, of having parents who are teachers just, just gives you tremendous advantage at home as far as being diligent, getting your homework done, and um, and I think the community that I grew up in was uh, a rural community, and the work ethic was just, uh, I, I would give anything if my kids had grown up and been able to grow up in that kind of a community where they were surrounded by worth eth ethic and values and things of that nature that made it kind of not natural to keep kind of toward the center of the road, but um, it sure helped you when you realize when you're getting over close to the ditch. Yeah, there was a sense of community that you were responsible to. Absolutely. But <clears throat> uh, when I found that I had to have a college degree in order to go to flying school, to get in the Air Force flying school, um, and I realized I was gonna I was gonna have to get a college degree, then Kansas State did not offer an aeronautical engineering degree at the time. University of Kansas did. Uh, I decided if I was going to go and put the effort out to go to school for four years, I was going to get a piece of paper that said airplane on it somewhere. And so that, that made me made my decision. And my parents, uh, bless their hearts, just backed me up 100%. And what, what part uh, did, did the ROTC play? Uh, did, is that a decision you made after you got to the University of Kansas? Or? No, I had decided ahead of time that I was going to enroll in uh, ROTC because it assured me of a, of a commission uh, in the Air Force when I graduated. If I When I got my degree, I would have my commission. And uh, at that time, if you were physically fit, uh, you were pretty well assured of getting a flight school assignment. Um, as it turned out, there was a somewhat of a glut of pilots when I graduated that year and I had to wait about nine months from the time I graduated until I was uh, could go to flight school for the backlog to work down. There was kind of a period in there for for, uh, for, for Korea where we, we sort of got caught and had to go back and reclaim the World War II guys to, to <laughs> that's get right. Korea covered, isn't that right? Or, that's right, yeah. yep, that's yeah. very true. Um, so at that time, I guess, obviously, World War II was still fresh in everybody's memory, followed by Korea. So you, you were 
you weren't thinking about test piloting, you were thinking about being a fighter pilot. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. <clears throat> However, uh, once I started school, um, um, we never we never were destitute or hungry because Dad always had a job during the Depression and, and post-Depression. And, and um, um, but um, I felt obligated if I was going to expend the resources to go to school that I, I ought to put that, <clears throat> that education uh, to use. And so uh, being, uh, being an aeronautical engineer was, was something that I felt, yeah, I could do that and that would, that would fill that square. And then when I realized that test pilots were also engineers and, and uh, did engineering type work, uh, then I thought, well, that's the best of both worlds. I get to put my degree to use, I get to fly. And uh, so becoming a test pilot was a, a, a goal rather early in my college career. Uh, but that, you, you did you joined obviously immediately. Uh, you you were active Air Force after you, after you graduated from University of Kansas. Right. right. So was there what maybe a a, a five year a period of service in there before you went to test pilot school? Or? There there was a time after graduation before actually being eligible to apply for the test pilot school, and that didn't that didn't bother me at all. I I think you alluded earlier that. Yeah, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I still wanted to be a fighter pilot, even though I couldn't fly P-40s and shoot down Jap Zeros. I, I still wanted to be a fighter pilot. And uh, an operational fighter pilot was really my goal when I went into the Air Force. And I thought, well, if being a test pilot is such a rare possibility that I won't even worry about that if I have to ever make that decision. But uh, uh, yes, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. And got had a chance to for a while simply because the requirements for test pilot school required uh, a good bit of operational flying time. I, I, I was really very fortunate in that um, I, I was I, I came along at a time when there was an opportunity uh, to fly a lot of different airplanes and very little restriction on how much you flew. Um, I think a lot of people would would fly a normal amount of, of hours a month, you know, 30 or 40 or 50, which is much more than pilots get now, but that seemed to be a really high end, but there was no limit on it. In fact, uh, it was obvious very early to me that to, to be selected as a test pilot it would not hurt to have flown as many different kinds of airplanes as you could, because that gave you more a broader experience of handling qualities of airplanes. So, uh, even as a as an operational uh, as a line fighter pilot flying F one hundreds at George, um, they had. L20s, uh, P80s that would tow targets, and and uh, Goonie Birds and T6s down at, at base ops. That you could go down and fly on weekends. All you need to do is check out in them, and then you could go fly them. So I took that opportunity, partly to build up hours so that I could become eligible for the test pilot school. And then at Edwards, when I got to Edwards, then then the fighter world opened up because. <clears throat> Boy, at that time at Edwards, they had all of the Century Series airplanes, and they were doing flight testing on new airplanes and some on old airplanes of weapons separation. So there was a ramp full of airplanes that they just flat encouraged you to go out and fly as many as you could. Was being a test pilot different than what you thought it was going to be when you decided I want to I, I want to do everything I can to get in the test pilot school? Test piloting is what I want to do. Did you get any surprises once you became a test? pilot? No, I don't think surprises. I didn't. I don't think I got any surprises necessarily when I was um, got into test pilot school and then subsequently into flight testing. I don't know that there are any real, <clears throat> real oh my gosh surprises, but there were certainly some realizations that there was a lot of work associated with flight testing an airplane and being a test pilot. There was there was a lot of what you would call grunt work. I think. Um, uh, stability and control and performance sawtooth climbs that, that were to be flown because at that time the ability to gather the correct data um, to get performance figures or performance specs out of an airplane it, it was it was all manual then there weren't any sophisticated instrumentation uh, on board the airplane and telemetry to the ground and immediate response of what the L over D is you had to go go fly repeated maneuvers and then average out the data, take the data points that didn't match too good or the ones that you didn't like, you didn't want to hear and call them erroneous and, and it was a fun time. Um, 
people who don't know anything about aviation, they think of test pilots as uh, uh, guys who live on the edge and, and, and live to take a risk uh, and, and, and that what they're doing is, is, is nothing but dangerous. They, they don't understand the depth of the work, the, the, how technical it is. Um, could, could you just maybe say, tell us a little bit in your own words about what a test pilot's life is like and you can pick any program that you worked on, uh, you know, uh, what a day-to-day -day life of a test pilot is. Well, uh, being a test pilot is, uh, there's a certain amount of risk that comes along periodically and normally you're quite aware of when you're going to be taking an airplane near the edge of its, of its envelope. Each airplane has its own comfort area and, and its own personality and uh, and and I think that uh, uh, there are times when when you're pushing an airplane close to the edge of, of what its envelope is and you certainly do a lot of preparation uh, in trying to figure out what what the indications are going to be that you're getting close to the edge is the airplane starting to tell you something and uh, how much farther should you push it in order to get good data to see whether that's real or not or whether you ought to back off and go back and look at the data on the ground. Um, uh, I think, uh, I don't ever recall really being concerned about uh, losing my life in, if an airplane got away because we had ejection seats and, and gee whiz, you know, when you're in your mid-twenties and you're given uh, free reign on flying all, get, climbing aboard all the thoroughbreds that are in the stable and uh, to go ride them and push them as hard as you can. Um, you you think well I can always if I really get in trouble I can always get out of this, and uh, you don't want to because it's uh, mm. it it's it just wouldn't cool to leave an airplane and get out of it if you could at all get it back, and I think that's where some people w w would get in trouble they would think that that they would be able to recover or get locked on and frozen on recovering when it was time to to uh, get it up and get out which I never had to do. If a young educated, qualified pilot came to you knowing what you know now and said, what I really want to do is be a test pilot, what would you, I don't, I'm not going to ask you what you'd say to him, but I'd ask you what you'd look for in that pilot to say, yeah, I think this guy's got what it takes to be a test pilot. What would you look for? Uh, I think dedication, motivation, dedication, and um, uh, the ability to assess to assess situations uh, correctly. To my knowledge, you're the only person that's flown two winged vehicles in space. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And I remember talking to a, our friend Hoot Gibson one time about when he went from F-14s and and being a fighter pilot into the shuttle program, and he said I never had any desire to get blasted in in a can into space and come back down and splash, but when they had when they came out with the shuttle program, I knew they were flying higher, faster, and farther than my F-14. <laughs> you know, he wanted to be an airplane pilot yeah. in space, not a space, not an astronaut. Can you talk about that a little bit? I'm not saying yours was the same experience. <laughs> well, no, I I, had, I felt very similar to who did on uh, as who did on that. I I wanted to fly airplanes, uh, even when there was talk of being flying into space. Um, the space programs that were getting the attention were, of course, the, the Mercury and Gemini programs, and they uh, they were not piloting programs. Uh, they were they required piloting skills and pilot knowledge, test pilot knowledge, but they didn't really push your piloting skills as far as an airplane goes. And and uh, I I feel very similar. I I felt uh, I really wanted to fly something that took piloting skills to to accomplish the mission. Um, I uh, I did I I must say that I did really want to go to the moon uh, when when the lunar flights were declared. That was something that I thought that's that's something I can accomplish. That that the community back home is going to be proud, and uh, and so I did I did really harbor a desire to do that. But I uh, at when I graduated from the test pilot school, uh, NASA was making a selection of astronauts at that time, a rather large group as a matter of fact, and uh, so um, I applied along with Mike Collins, who was a classmate of mine, and, and um, we applied, and uh, 
the uh, the general who was in, who was the commander at flight test center at Edwards called me in and he said I I'm pulling your application and I thought maybe it was because you know I, I wasn't as qualified as some of the others and he didn't want to ruin the reputation of of Edwards by doing it. It turned out that I had already been selected for the X-15 program and and I was not at all sorry when I found that out. I, the X-15 was a was just a pilot's dream because it was a spacecraft. You flew it into space, but it was an airplane. It had to be a little bit of a roller coaster ride because later you did have a place on a on an Apollo mission, and and they they sent a geologist. Instead. That, that's true. That's very true. Uh, I was the backup lunar module pilot, module pilot for Apollo 14, and the, the sequence was to daisy chain every third flight, which meant that Apollo 17 uh, was our flight, and everyone assumed that that was what was going to happen. However, as soon as Apollo 14 landed, uh, Congress had cut the budget for NASA, and they they um, they, they uh, cut Apollo 18, 19, and 20, the last three Apollo flights off. In Apollo 18, uh, Jack Schmidt was a backup pilot, lunar module pilot for Apollo 15, and would have been on Apollo 18. Um, Jack had a doctorate degree in field geology, and of course the lunar missions were all focused on <clears throat> geology. Um, and it it made sense. It wasn't my idea, but it made sense to me, and it was a correct decision that Jack would be moved up to the last Apollo flight so that the science community could say, yes, we had a real no kidding scientist and we brought back the right rocks from the moon. How did they determine who went down to the surface and who flew the, the orbiter? Uh, oh, on the lunar missions? Yeah. That was uh, pretty much strictly a a sequential, uh, a successful sequential uh, arrangement of, of uh, steps of going and landing on the moon. Uh, first, the command module was tested in Earth orbit. And then, if you'll recall, the lunar module was tested in Earth orbit and uh, separated rendezvous and docking in Earth orbit to make sure that that operation was okay. Uh, now, granted, uh, uh, interjected in there was Apollo 8, which circled the moon. And that mission was a bold adventure because um, evidently the State Department had learned that the Russians were up on the verge of sending a, a, a mission to the moon, not to land, but a, a manned mission around the moon. Um, we, had the t we had the ability to do it at that time, and that decision was made for to send Frank's crew on a circling mission around the moon and right back. The, uh, uh, that took care of Apollo 8, Apollo 9, uh, which was circling the Earth with the lunar, mission, lunar module. Uh, Apollo 10 was, if you will, a dress rehearsal for the landing. Uh, the lunar module that was to land on the moon was not, was not completed yet. It, it was a lighter weight, it was a modification, so that it could, in fact, have enough propellant to land and, and lift off. But there was a lunar, mo but a lunar module was available that could go through all the motions, deorbit, get into lunar sor uh, or lunar orbit, uh, and go down to within about ten thousand feet above the surface, and then essentially abort the and come back up and rendezvous, and that would, in turn, uh, complete that step, the incremental step of going to the moon. Could have skipped some of those steps, but this was the safe way to do it. So then uh, Apollo 11 then became the mission that would land. Um, had you uh, kept your place on, on, on the mission which you were scheduled, you would have been the, uh, the uh, lunar module, not, you would have been... Yes, lunar module pilot. pilot. No, I'd have been the lunar module pilot. The lunar module pilot that would have been... Gone to the surface, yes. You would have gone to the surface? Yes, Gene, Gene, Gene Cernan and I, um, we trained as, as Al and, and Ed's backup on 14. We trained uh, so that we could have stepped in at the last minute if something had happened to that crew. So we trained for the mission, all the mission itself. We trained for the lunar surface as, as best as everybody knew, what, what craters to go to, what, what geologic samples to, to get and bring back. Well, let's get back to the X-15 program. You, you, you've been told that your astronaut uh, application is being pulled because of the X-15 program. How did they lay out the X-15 program for you, explain it to you, talk about the objectives, 
How did they, how did they describe to you what you were getting into? <laughs> <laughs> well, the X-15 had, <clears throat> when I when I was told that I would not, that my application was being pulled for NASA, I wasn't told a reason at the time. Uh, General Branch just said, we've got something in mind for you here. I don't think you'll be disappointed. And um, heck, I was a captain at that time. So a two-star general, you know, you figure you got to trust a guy like that. <laughs> I was thrilled to death because the X-15, as I think I mentioned before, was was the airplane that everybody, at every test pilot that ever walked, would love to have flown. And uh, to have to get the opportunity to fly it was a, just a real thrill. And there wasn't uh, we knew what the objectives of the X-15 program were at that time. Uh, they were largely um, speed flights, heating handling qualities at hypersonic Mach numbers, uh, thermal, aerothermal constraints at hypersonic Mach numbers, and then the other basic area, which was space, which was to fly out of the atmosphere and develop techniques and, and methods and how we're going to fly a winged vehicle from exo-atmosphere, above the atmosphere, back into the atmosphere and transition to aerodynamic surfaces again and, and land it like a conventional airplane. That was just about the height of, of what you could imagine to get to do as a test pilot. Well, the uh, the flight testing program on the X-15, uh, declaring it completed, was that, that wasn't something that was done in advance. There were goals set, goals to reach Mach 6 and 250,000 feet. Uh, it was, Mach 6 was about the maximum speed that it could obtain with the propellant that it had on board. But it was obvious early in the game that 250,000 feet was not the limit to where you could go with the X-15. Uh, so the altitude build-up program, or the incremental build-up program in altitude, uh, was a fascinating thing because we were learning, <clears throat> we were learning about transitioning from aerodynamic flight, flying with stick with the uh, rudders and elevators, and uh, transitioning from that into flying in space with reaction controls to control the attitude of the vehicle. Uh, naively, but but uh, logically, the engineers felt, well, uh, you'll fly with the aerodynamic controls up to a certain altitude, and then you can quit flying with them and reach over and grab the reaction control handle and fly the attitude with that. You won't be able to maneuver, change your ground track or anything. It'll be a ballistic arc over the top, but it's very necessary to control altitude very precisely for the entry. And they arbitrarily picked an altitude of um, 140,000 feet at first, saying that, well, uh, maybe off a little bit. We may have to adjust that, but that's what we're going to find out. Uh, it turned out that it, it, it was not, there was no magic line, uh, altitude line, where you quit where, space, where airplane flying quits and where space flying begins. The atmosphere uh, gets less dense very, very slowly. And uh, the higher you go, the, the rate of change is even less. So it's a very subtle transition from flying conventional airplane controls to flying reaction controls. And uh, one of the big, one of the big uh, lessons learned in the X-15 program was that uh, that is a very gradual transition and uh, it's very difficult for pilots on board to know <clears throat> and to appropriately decrease reliance on aerodynamic controls, increase reliance on reaction controls going up and just the opposite coming back down. And because of that, because we made some mistakes and uh, uh, almost ran out of, uh, we did run out of reaction control propellant because we were using it too long during the re-entry, uh, we learned that it was necessary to develop a flight control system that could sense uh, when the aerodynamic surfaces were becoming ineffective and therefore augment them with reaction controls to most efficiently fly the exit and the entry. And, uh, and the flight control system for the entry flight control system on the space shuttle is a, a direct derivative and, and the same the same techniques are used only in software in the flight control system as, as was developed on the X-15. I can't imagine there isn't anyone who wouldn't understand it, but uh, the, the audience would need to understand that the flight, the, the conventional or 
aerodynamic flight controls become inoperative without atmosphere. That's correct. Yes, the, the yes the aerodynamic surfaces as you get higher in altitude, uh, there's less density, less molecules passing over the surface, and therefore they become less and less effective until they become just essentially not effective at all. And and I apologize, but you you asked uh, about uh, determining or knowing what the when the X-15 program was going to be completed uh, because the airplane exceeded the design limits, both speed and, and in altitude. Uh, uh, the airplane was flown to an altitude where it was felt it was not effective to go any higher with the X-15. Um, the risk increased much more than what the benefits gained were going to be, and, and the lesson was learned, uh, the objective was learned. As far as speed was concerned, uh, there was an attempt to go much faster with the X-15 than its design limit of Mach 6, and that was to add additional propellant um, in the form of external tanks that would be dropped off. And the purpose was to get the airplane out to a speed of about Mach 8, because there was a, uh, a scramjet engine in development that was to operate, air breathing engine that was to operate at Mach 8, uh, and it was going to be used as a test bed to take the engine out there. So there was a goal to get to Mach 8. Turned out that Really, with just some things, very, very painful lessons learned that um, the overlaying shock waves just increase the heating even that much more at those hypersonic speeds. And and uh, at about 6.7, uh, the shock wave from this little dummy ramjet, scramjet engine, impinged on the lower ventral and literally burned it off. And um, so it, it it was determined that that was enough. Uh, even trying to protect the X-15 with ablative coating didn't, didn't help. How many uh, <clears throat> test pilots entered the X-15 program? Twelve. Twelve, twelve pilots flew the X-15. Uh, how many of them uh, flew it to the, I, I guess I'll just say the textbook definition of space? <laughs> there, of the twelve pilots who flew the X-15, eight were designated as astronauts, having flown over 50 miles. Uh, in the United States, um, 50, 50 statute miles, or 283,000 feet, 283,400 feet or something like that, is is the magic line, if you will. There, there of course, is no magic line when you're really there in space, but, but uh, in order uh, to have a word to say, where does space start? We use 50 miles. Uh, Europeans use 60 kilometers because it's an even number, and uh, and that's uh, that's a little higher. That's uh, or I'm sorry, they use 100 kilometers, which is 60 miles. So uh, although it, nobody really argues about, okay, did you make it or did you not make it? Uh, roughly that altitude range of 50 to 60 miles above the Earth. Uh, there, there was one test pilot that did not survive the program. There was Mike Adams um, lost control uh, during entry in the X-15 and subsequently the airplane broke up in a, in a hypersonic spin essentially is what they called it. Uh, the airplane broke up and Mike was not able to eject or get out uh, in time and lost his life. That was the only fatality from the pilots in the X-15. Do, do we know pretty well what happened? I think, I think we know precisely what happened really. Um, um, Mike, because of a because of, of not being perfectly aligned for entry into the into the atmosphere. He had some yaw set up. Uh, the airflow at the high angle of attack uh, got underneath, pulled the you know, pulled up on the lower ventral fin. The upper ventral fin was was behind all the shock waves. And the airplane went into an oscillation and in about three oscillations it was out of control. And that was that was something that was predicted. Uh, from simulators uh, and from data that we had collected till then. And it was a matter of an instrument in the cockpit giving a wrong indication of when you're lined up for entry. Do you remember the first time you said, I, I am definitely in space at this point. You know, I, 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 am, I am out of the Earth's atmosphere. Do you remember the, the first time you saw space, so to speak? And you were probably so busy you didn't think much about it, but... <laughs> well, uh, no, I don't think there was any any particular realization of uh, 
well, I made it into space and now I'm back in the atmosphere again. Because on the altitude build-up flights, um, a, a pilot who was going to become part of the the altitude sequence of testing was given a build-up series. We go higher and higher to transition to learn incrementally what it's like to fly without aerodynamic controls. And um, oh, I can't tell you what the altitude was, but it, it's relatively low when you look up and it's black. It's not it's not a blue sky anymore. It's total blackness. And you look out to the horizon and you can see the banding on the atmosphere uh, from from black to purple to dark blue to light blue to the earth. And um, um, on the altitude buildup phase, I think it was a transition gradual enough that there wasn't any any big, um, the no bells or whistles went off on the flight that, that I knew I was going to go over the 283,000 foot mark. Talk about uh, the Neil Armstrong going to Burbank and back. Are you overshot or? Something like that? Yeah. Um, we had one incident um, where uh, during re-entry from an altitude flight, uh, mm -hmm. the sequence was, it was all manual. There was, no gui there was no guidance to tell you, you know, when to get rid of energy, when to not. Um, we had a ground control who was doing radar tracking with some rather rudimentary tracking with the needles, you know, on an oscilloscope that would tell you what the altitude was, and the other one would tell you ground track. Um, but the sequence was to um, assume an attitude about about 10 or 15 degrees nose low below the horizon. And you'd look out the window and set that up. Or you could look at your attitude indicator, uh, either one, and set the, set the attitude up. And then fly as you began to get into the atmosphere then, the, the angle of attack indicator, which was on the nose of the airplane, would begin to function, would start to work as you gradually entered the atmosphere. And when when you started getting steady readings from angle of attack, then you would transition from that eyeball attitude to an angle of attack of 26 degrees and hold that until the density built up to where you got to five and a half Gs. At five and a half Gs, then you would push over a little and hold five and a half Gs so as not to overstress the airplane until you got minus, I think it was 1500 feet a second sink rate and then push over to hold that so you'd continue to go into the dense air, get speed brakes out, slow up, and start managing your energy to land at Edwards. If you didn't, if you held the, the, the five Gs too long, uh, then you would climb back up and skip out of the atmosphere, get back up into the very rare atmosphere, and then essentially not have any energy control until you settled back down again. And and Neil was, was uh, uh, his attention was diverted, and I don't recall what the incident was on board, but he started a, a rate of climb and uh, started climbing back up. And by the time the ground realized that and called him, it was too late to roll over and try and suck down. He just skipped over Edwards and Palmdale and finally ended up making the turn over Burbank and, uh, and then had, had, of course, the task of, of uh, going to maximum lift to drag ratio, glide angle, and trying to stretch the glide back to the lake bed at Edwards, landing the other direction, coming in from the south rather than north like we normally do. But man, he made it. He did uh, exceptional piloting skill to to get the airplane to fly a good enough performance to make it back to the field. A good lesson learned there too. Did, did he end up in the lake bed or on the on the runway? He ended up on the lake bed, on the south end of the lake bed. We always landed on the lake bed oh, with the X-15 because it had skids, steel skids on the back rather than wheels. And the nose gear was not steerable; it was a castered nose wheel. So, we really, we really, by design, the airplane was designed very, very simply, so everything would work every time, hopefully. And uh, lake bed landings were, were what we did all the time. Yeah, no, that's that's my second question. Kind of walk us through that landing with the skids. Everybody's seen the footage. Yeah, how you come in and come down on the nose like that and you mm -hmm. probably tried to hold it as off as long mm -hmm. as you could but it was impossible correct yeah and uh i've seen that footage where one kind of snapped in half or yeah. something like that yeah we could talk about a landing and something like that okay all right well the the landing characteristics of the air the x-15 were essentially pretty conventional for a flamed out 
fighter. In fact, uh, the F-104 was a great simulation of, uh, of uh, the X-15. You could come to idle, put speed brakes out, put the gear down, and you had just about the same glide ratio as the X-15. And we would practice that with, with the uh, F-104, but, but once uh, the airplane touched down, it had some rather unique characteristics. The, the skids, the main, what would be the, considered the main gear, were two skids, steel skids, right at the aft end of the airplane. They, they were at the aft end because uh, the nose wheel, which was a conventional nose wheel, but it did not have any nose wheel steering, so uh, it was fully a castable nose wheel. So the idea was to put the skids <clears throat> as far back to give as much directional stability once the airplane touched down. Um, the, the skids being right at the back end meant that, that instead of the landing gear in the center, so when you touch down, you could pull back on the stick and, and have the slab come up and push down and, and gently let the nose down, like pilots like to do, make a graceful nose gear touch down. Uh, it wasn't possible with the X-15 because your leverage point was right back under where you were going to push down. So when the main gear touched, the nose was going to slam down and you would grit your teeth every time because you knew it wasn't going to be pretty, but, but it was designed to do that. Uh, directionally, uh, we always landed on the dry lake bed plenty of uh, width in case the airplane wanted to veer off to the right or left. And you could really influence it to some extent right at first. And by uh, was the nose, when the nose came down, uh, as if it started to veer off to the, to the right, for example, you could put in left aileron. And that would, would unload one side, load up the other side for the skid, and it would drag it around and, and generally steer it uh, down to about 100 knots. Beyond that, it was going to go wherever it wanted to. But the, the bad thing about that was that pilots in, intuitively or instinctively, once you touched, you'd start back on the on the stick, yeah, and try and hold it off, and it didn't do a bit of good. All it did was throw the slab up, put more weight on the main gear, and, and we eventually did, in fact, fail one main landing gear uh, during a landing at Mud Lake, emergency landing at Mud Lake. And then you were you were chosen to uh, to do the reentry work uh, with the space shuttle program. To, to test that. You mean Enterprise? Yes. On the 747? Enterprise. Those were, uh, Enterprise was uh, really done to test the final approach and landing uh, and to give the, uh, the systems, the hydraulic systems and uh, uh, all of the operating avionics uh, in flight checkout before committing to an orbital flight with the real bird. Um, and and this, this was by design in the Space Shuttle Design and Development Program. Um, the, uh, the free flight program was going to be, originally it was going to be a whole bunch of flights, I think 15 flights, and it eventually got cut down to 11 and then down to 9, and essentially, eventually it got cut down to 5 flights because they went very successfully and, and everything seemed to check out. Uh, th these flights were flown on top uh, of a Boeing 747. Uh, the way the aircraft is ferried now and the way you see on the news uh, periodically when they have to land at Edwards for weather reasons and then ferry it back to Kennedy. Uh, the difference was that we had a different angle of, of incidence. We had a higher angle of incidence uh, during those flights. More drag, so it's not effic as efficient to ferry it, but Fitz could get the airplane, the, the 747, going fast enough so that at 240 knots uh, we could initiate separation of pyro bolts and fly off the top and then glide test it at Edwards. Uh, the flights were particularly tail cone off flights, the re-entry configuration were from about 20,000 feet to the surface and those flights took about two and a half minutes. And in those flights we were able to check out the handling qualities, get some flight test data on the airplane and, and get some maturity on the hydraulic systems, the APUs, electronic systems and, and all, of, all of the systems on board. There is, there is one thing that I, I would like to comment about the X-15 program that, that impressed me, I think, as much as anything, uh, possibly as much as the airplane itself, which was a wonderful flying airplane, a great machine. Um, but that was um, the people and the attitude uh, of everyone who was involved on that X-15 program. There were, there were NASA people, Air Force people, even a few Navy people that during the early parts of the program um, who worked together so closely and in, and in such a camaraderie attitude um, a goal objective, the goal being s safely flying the X-15, 
while expanding the envelope. Um, but there was a, a, just a community relationship that I have not seen in two major um, agencies, government agencies, uh, since I left that program, quite frankly. It just was an awesome experience and an awesome environment to be in at the time. I wonder if we'll ever achieve that again. I hope so. I hope so. I think, I think as a matter of fact, uh, we may realize that we have to develop that same kind of an attitude internationally now uh, for spaceflight because it's becoming so expensive that no one country can really uh, support finance and budget um, a program to go to Mars, for example. It, it's going to have to be um, an Earth effort, a world effort. The, the Soaring Society Certificate of Achievement. Are you a sailplane pilot? Did they give that to you for your test pilot? <laughs> Actually, uh, I, uh, uh, Paul Bickle was very, very good when we were getting ready to fly X-15. Actually, we were getting ready to fly the lifting bodies. He insisted that we go up to the Hatchby and get sailplane qualified. The, the real purpose was that were, were, was to get um, some experience on the tow rope behind an airplane. Uh, but I did get sailplane qualified there and uh, enjoyed it very, very much. And um, I can't say that uh, that that really helped in flying or or feeling comfortable with the approach for the X-15 or the space shuttle. I think. I think simulating flame out approaches in fighters was a much closer simulation for that. But it gave a good tow rope experience for the lifting bodies. The test flight for, for the orbital test flight, STS orbital test flight, mm -hmm. that, about 1980 or 81 or something? 81. Can mm -hmm. we talk about that a little bit? We sure can. That, uh, the, second, the second flight um, on Columbia, um, <clears throat> it, it, uh, it grew into a, a true flight test program, and uh, a, a test flight, if you will. Uh, the first flight, uh, the decision was made to correctly let the guidance bring it right down the chute. Don't perturbate it at all. Uh, make everything was op make sure everything was optimum and ideal, and just get it down. And um, after that was successful, NASA realized that, yes, we, we were going to need to fly and look at the airplane in some off-nominal situation, as you do in any flight test program. Uh, to see how robust the airplane is, stability, control-wise, um, how much margin there is uh, thermodynamically as you enter the atmosphere as far as how sensitive it is to angle of attack, because that determines how much range or cross-range you have. Uh, and, and to see, to begin to get data to determine how much margin there was we could count on in case we did have a real emergency with the airplane. Wind tunnel data is good, but it isn't, it sometimes you run into limits on how you can use that data. So we were able to uh, develop, convince NASA to develop a series of flight test data inputs, pulsing the airplane in pitch, doublet, using doublets and sometimes singlets in pitch and roll and yaw, and sweeping the angle of attack to see how the temperature changed at different angles of attack during entry at different Mach numbers all the way down. Uh, we built a, a test program an aggressive program uh, with the idea that if we started running behind or didn't didn't feel comfortable or ran into some problems we would uh, we would cease to make these inputs and just let the guidance bring it in and go back and look at data fortunately we did not see any anomalies during the entry and and we were able to manually fly the airplane all the way down from Mach 25 all the way to touchdown getting data at various decreasing Mach numbers as we entered those same data points were then <clears throat> subsequently built into the automatic guidance system uh, so that guidance could then initiate those maneuvers and you had the ability to inhibit those maneuvers but guidance would be able to do those maneuvers and that's still done today as a matter of fact. We need to talk about STS-51 which I have read somewhere was the most successful shuttle flight to, the, to date some people <laughs> say. Well uh, certainly to that to, to that time, uh, 51I was, was a very, again, a very aggressive mission that was put together, uh, really it was initially going to be the deployment of three communication satellites, uh, which in itself was a busy mission, but certainly not uh, spectacular or, or trend-setting. Uh, just about three months prior to our, our mission, uh, we were taking a large Navy communication satellites, 
uh, up into orbit, weighed about 15,000 pounds, completely filled up the payload, the aft end of the payload bay, uh, was 15 feet across, uh, a monstrous thing, and there was a series of four of these communication satellites that were to be deployed for the Navy, actually, for Navy communications. Uh, the, the flight before ours, uh, one of these was deployed, and it did not activate, <clears throat> it didn't come to life. A little micro switch that when it rolls out of the payload bay is supposed to close and then start the, start the sequencing of spinning up and deploying antennas and, and then firing its motor to take it on up to a geosynchronous orbit. Uh, so at first we were very, you know, we went to our director of flight crew operations and said, man, I, we, got a, we got the perfect chance to bring this back down, bring that vehicle back down. We, we're carrying the next one up in the cradle. We'll deploy it. We'll just go rendezvous with it, bring it, put it in the cradle, and bring it back home. You can fix it and send it up again. An $85 million satellite. And uh, that looked pretty attractive. Uh, the only thing was, it, it, because it didn't come to life, it was dead in the water. And so uh, there was no way to uh, there was no way to dump the fuel on it, and the fuel was very toxic, and they were decided they don't even want it close to the shuttle. No one even wanted it in the payload bay, let alone coming in with an entry. So the decision was made by the Hughes company who built the satellite, but we, we, know, we know where the problem is. Um, we can essentially hotwire around from the battery bus around to the electronics and bypass the switch that didn't close, bring it back to life, and use it again if these guys can get up there and do that. So we, we convinced them that, yeah, we can do that. So we, uh, we launched and deployed our three satellites and then went over and rendezvoused with this one that was not operable at all. Um, flew up next to it, uh, big ox Van Hoften, who, who, if he hadn't been as big as he was, I don't think we'd have been able to convince him, yeah, it was okay to get something that big. Reached up, grabbed it, and very gently brought it into 15,000 pounds, brought it into the payload bay, and we secured it. And uh, he and, uh, and fish uh, then removed panels, rewired it, and, and got it working again, redeployed it manually, and uh, got it back working. And it was, it's, in fact, as far as I know, it's still working today. And somewhere there's a farmer in Kansas who said manual labor will always be. <laughs> you can always fall back to manual labor. The combine breaks, you can go out there with a side and cut wheat. <laughs> So let, let's talk about uh, leaving the Air Force and, and going into the Kansas Air National Guard and that, that part of your life. Uh, I, I, was, I was thrilled, quite frankly, to have the opportunity to go in into the Air National Guard, uh, initially through the Kansas Air National Guard, and the, the reason for that um, is part of the story. I, I was due to retire from the Air Force um, in um, February of 1986, and if you recall in January of 1986 when Challenger uh, accident happened at the Cape during liftoff, um, I had gotten to know Pete Aldridge, who was at that time the Secretary of the Air Force. He had come down to NASA to train to be the, the uh, mission specialist on the first flight out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. He was under Secretary of the Air Force then. He could do that. He had a little bit of cover at that time, and, and uh, he, he could trained to do that. And we got to be very good friends. Um, his family lived there in Houston. And uh, um, so when when uh, Challenger accident happened, uh, Pete knew that I was about to retire. And he called and asked if I would uh, stay in the Air Force for another year, if, if he would if he would approve a year extension if I would stay in, because he didn't want it to look like people were bailing out because they were afraid the, air, the shuttle was not safe. And uh, I was thrilled to do it because that meant I got to keep flying T-38s, and I didn't know what I was going to fly if I didn't if I didn't get to fly those 38s at NASA. So I did. And uh, then a year later, when it was time to retire, he called me up to his office in the Pentagon, and he said, uh, um, and uh, General Conway was there at the time, the commander of the Air National Guard, and and he said, we've been talking, we want to try and get um, the National Guard involved in some space activities. And we think that if you were to take the job of assistant, guard assistant to sink space, commander chief of space, and commander chief of NORAD, that we might be able to figure out some things. He said, would you be willing to do that? And um, I, 
of course, I uh, sure I was ready to do it. And uh, and uh, General Conway said, uh, "Yeah, but it's not going to be easy." He said, I, "This isn't going to be a weekend every month thing." Uh, he said, "We want you really involved in this, uh, and it's NORAD as well. That's air defense, uh, so you'll have to go around." Um, to all the Air Defense Command squadrons around the perimeter of the country, find out what their problems are, brief us back on that, uh, and oh, by the way, you'll have to go get checked out in the F-4 right now, which is what most of them are flying, fly with these units, and then check out in the F-16 as we transition into that. And um, how both of them kept straight face, I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, I sure couldn't. I, in fact, I got all gooey-eyed and, and I said, they, Said, well, we we figured it if we, if we didn't give a cock, if a cockpit job didn't come along with it, well, you probably wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> so I was thrilled. I, I got to fly another, essentially another five years. Got to fly fighters, and I was just thrilled with that. I, I think there are just an awful lot of people who hate to see the space shuttle program wind down and come to a close. Uh, people who are working on the continuing programs, of course to them, it means uh, budget availability that they can increase their efforts on their programs. And so their, their, uh, their feelings are somewhat subdued as far as saying goodbye to the shuttle. The space shuttle is a tremendous workhorse. Uh, it was designed to carry heavy loads into Earth orbit, low Earth orbit. And uh, it was designed to carry com uh, components, large components, of the International Space Station and assemble them uh, on orbit. The reality is it's a very expensive program to, to maintain. It would be great if we could keep that asset, that national asset, that global asset really, and keep flying the space shuttle and continue the exploration and the research in other areas that we want to do. But the budget is just not there. And right now, as, as everyone knows, budgets are very tight for everything, everybody. So uh, those painful decisions had to be made of, of um, uh, discontinuing flights on the space shuttle, bringing that program to a close, taking what budget is available to NASA and putting it on other areas of research, continued flights out to moon and back to, Mar back to moon and on out to Mars. And that is the, that's the current plan. One question that I, I wish people talked more about is why it is so important that we keep doing this despite all the problems we have to solve here on Earth and all the, all the social issues. Why, why does it matter that we continue to find out what's out there and be, and be a part of our own destiny? Well, I think, it's, I think it's a natural instinctive thing for the human species, not, not just Americans, but the whole world, to want to explore and want to find out and find the answers and solutions of going deeper and deeper into space or wherever, whatever research field it is. Uh, unfortunately, the financial situation is the same all over the world. We, we don't, we're not unique in not having a, as much of a space budget as we'd like to have. Russia is severely hampered by that same problem. They have a lot of capability, a lot of skills, a lot of skilled people. Uh, we work together technically uh, as engineers and as space voyagers. We work together wonderfully. Uh, we both, we both uh, are subject to the political over, overviews and overtones because that's where the budgets from both countries come from. So we have to be sensitive to that. But uh, no, it, it's a shame that, that, that the, the decisions of well, what do we get back from going to space? Well, gosh, we have, don't have to look around us very much to, to determine what, what we enjoy today that we take for advantage that came from space exploration, not from going to the moon, but from developing the capability to go to the moon and to get people back safely. Um, health benefits, safety benefits, clothes that we wear, materials that we use, um, software that we use, uh, communications that we use. We watch, we watch direct television from all over the world now and don't think a thing about it. Don't even think a thing about those signals actually going to satellites that were put up because we know how to put satellites up and communicate with them now. So it, uh, uh, I think every generation suffers from that 
why, why are we going to put money into research? Every company suffers from why put so much of our overhead into research when that isn't what really makes some money. Well, right now, I think that many people want to go into space, however you want to define space, uh, because it's unique and because they've seen feedback on television of how great it is to float around in zero gravity and to work in a zero gravity environment and to look back at the Earth from space, which incidentally is one of the most inspirational things that I think you can do, a person can do. And I'm not a very inspirational guy. I'm, uh, I tried to train to be a, a test pilot where you divorce yourself from all that emotional stuff. But, but it is. There's no getting around it. Uh, looking back at the Earth from space and seeing how delicate, how beautiful it is, uh, and how we really all do live on just this one ball out in the middle of nowhere, uh, it, it makes you realize that we do need to work together and get along together. And it gives you a whole new appreciation for environmental things and getting along with people, social things, political things. Well, uh, as far as, as uh, space being more commonplace, more accessible to, to the guy on the street, to Joe Sixpack, you know, Joe Bag of Donuts maybe is more appropriate, uh, it, it, will, it will happen. It will be some time because going into space is an expensive thing. There's a there is some risk. There's a great deal of risk assessment in, in building vehicles to go to take people into space and back. Joe, is it possible for you to look back at, at all the things you've done and say, that one, really, that one more than anything, I'm glad that I did for those that are coming after me? Uh, or, or is that too hard to do? Well, if, <laughs> if there were any one thing, I think you really have hit on a very, very appropriate Point, and that is that I think a lot of test pilots, a lot of people in this business are there not for the glory or the television or what the moment in the sun. It's there to walk away and, and have people say, by gosh, he made a difference, uh, a positive difference. And, uh, and uh, I think that I feel very, very fortunate that I don't know of any one thing that stands out more than the other, but I, I feel that I've been given the opportunity to take part in a lot of things that, a lot of uh, programs that will make a difference for people, and I'm very, very appreciative of that. The X-15, designed to be purely and simply a research vehicle to provide aerodynamic, flight dynamic, and structural response data for use in the development of future manned hypersonic vehicles, such as the Space Shuttle. No hypersonic wind tunnels, past or present, can provide accurate data for the design of a full-scale hypersonic airplane. The frontiers of flight today are the same as they were in the 1950s, the exploration of hypersonic flight. The X-15 will ultimately be viewed as the right flyer of hypersonic airplanes. The X-15 flew to speeds and altitudes never previously achieved by wind vehicles. On the crisp, clear morning of November 9, 1961, a prospector working any of the many small mining claims in the bleak country around Mud Lake would have noticed the telltale broad white contrail signaling the approach of a strange formation of aircraft. If his eyesight was particularly acute, he might have discerned a giant Boeing NB-52B Stratofortress arrowing through Nevada's dark blue sky, flanked by two sleek little fighters, a North American F-100 Super Sabre and a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. As he watched, he might have seen a long black dart drop from the B-52, followed by the sudden boom and crackling rumble of an igniting rocket engine. Boosted by 60,000 pounds of thrust, it let the head of the big bomber and its chase planes accelerating upwards as it burned a ton of anhydrous ammonia and liquid oxygen every 12 seconds. It arced into the trans-atmosphere, its white exhaust trail pointing like a finger toward the future. Not quite 90 seconds later, it was level at 102,000 feet, streaking towards Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California at Mach 6.04. Air Force test pilot Major Robert White had just become the first man to take an airplane to Mach 6, six times the speed of sound, flying the second of three North American Aviation X-15 research airplanes. Slightly less than eight minutes and 200 miles later, trailed by another F-104 chase plane, 
the X-15, its propellants exhausted, and now the world's fastest glider, dropped into a steep curve to a landing flare and touchdown on runway 18, marked out on the hard-baked clay of Rogers Dry Lake, the world's largest natural landing site. The X-15 program was a natural outgrowth of progression of aviation since the time of the Wrights. The biplane had given way to the streamlined monoplane, and by the late 1930s, the first experimental jet engines had appeared, promising an era of high-speed flight. But as an airplane flew closer to the speed of sound, it encountered compressibility, the bunching up of air around it as it neared Mach 1, causing high drag, buffeting, changes in structural loads, and even loss of control and in-flight breakups. For more than a decade, until Chuck Yeager flew the first Bell XS-1, later X-1, to Mach 1.06 in October of 1947, it seemed that the speed of sound might indeed be a barrier to the future flight. Afterward, aviation accelerated rapidly into the supersonic era, Mach 2 fell to Scott Crossfield and the second Douglas D558-2 Skyrocket in November 1953, and Mach 3 to Captain Milburn Apt and the first Bell X-2 in September 1956, though tragically, he perished when the plane went out of control during its return to Edwards. By the time of Apt's death, the X-15 program was well underway. Its designers faced formidable challenges. Bell had built advanced variants of the X-1 that could excel at Mach 2 and 90,000 feet, and the swept-wing X-2 could climb above 125,000 feet. Both hinted at control challenges the X-15 would face. In 1956, when test pilot Captain Ivan C. Kinch coasted to above 126,000 feet, his X-2 was like an artillery shell following a ballistic parabola. Near the top of its climb, as the plane decelerated after its rocket engine ran out of propellant, its ailerons, elevators, and rudder were useless due to the very low dynamic pressure encountered as it passed through the upper atmosphere. The X-2 began a slow left roll, arced over the top of its ballistic parabola, and, as its speed and, consequently, dynamic pressure increased in the lower atmosphere, its flight controls regained their effectiveness, and Kinchlow was able to guide it back to a safe landing on Edwards Broad Lakebed. Clearly, flying above 100,000 feet, future rocket planes would require reaction controls, small jet thrusters such as those employed on the first manned spacecraft, in addition to conventional aerodynamic control surfaces. Aerodynamic heating and the high-altitude environment pose their own problems. Unlike supersonic flight, which is differentiated by the speed of sound and the distinctive crack of a sonic boom, Hypersonic flight is characterized primarily by increasing aerodynamic heating with intensity hot airflows and sharply angled shock waves washing over the structure, their interactions producing even greater heat. The structure could not be conventional, for the plane would be subject to skin temperatures above 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, necessitating extensive thermal protection. Inside the fully pressurized cockpit, the pilot would be more astronaut than airman, wearing a pressure suit and helmet capable of functioning in space-like conditions should cabin pressure be lost. Interest in hypersonic flight predated the supersonic revolution. The three great prophets of the space age, Russia's Konstantin Zalkowski, the Romanian-German Hermann Oberth, and America's Robert Goddard, all advocated hypersonic airplanes as a means of flying into space, and German rocket enthusiast Max Valier, before his death and the explosion of an experimental rocket engine, recommended developing rocket-powered either planes as intercontinental airliners. In the 1930s, Austrian engineer Eugen Sanger and the mathematician Irene Brett undertook the world's first science-based hypersonic design, their so-called Silbervogel, Silver Bird, Proposed as a space transport and later as a global strike aircraft, it became an extraordinarily influential design study. Right after World War II, Joseph Stalin, according to a Soviet military defector, even sent a team into Western Europe on a fruitless mission to kidnap authors, hoping that Soviet Sanga planes would make it easier for us to talk to the gentleman shopkeeper Harry Truman. 
The culmination of the Sangha Brett study an example of a Nazi A-4 V-2 ballistic missile greatly simulated post-war American, Soviet, and European interest in rockets, missiles, and hypersonic aircraft. While the Sangha Brett study had been purely theoretical, the A-4 program had extensively studied Mach 4 plus wing derivatives, one of which, the A-4B, flew before war's end, though it broke up during its terminal glide to Earth. The Soviet-American race to develop atomic-armed ballistic missiles fostered heating and re-entry studies, evolution of the blunt body re-entry shape, and high-temperature materials research. It also encouraged studies of rocket-boosted winged global-ranging hypersonic vehicles, even orbital spacecraft. In America, from all this sprang the X-15 and X-20 programs, though the latter never flew. The roots of the X-15 reflected a broad base of military, industrial, and governmental research support. In 1951, Robert Woods, Bell Aircraft Corporation's chief engineer and a member of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, prestigious Aeronautics Committee, called for development of new research airplane with performance similar to the A-4s. His continued pressure led NACA's executive committee to endorse, a year later, investigating flight conditions between Mach 4 and Mach 10. The agency formed a hypersonic study committee under Langley Aeronautical Laboratory, now NASA Langley Research Center, engineer Clinton Brown, which subsequently advocated greatly expanded ground and flight research tests using models and specialized test techniques. The committee even suggested modifying the X-2 with a strap-on booster to increase performance above Mach 4, adding reaction controls for flight safety. Program delays and eventual loss of both airplane doomed that idea. In 1953, the Air Force's Scientific Advisory Board concluded that time is ripe for a Mach 5-7 to hypersonic vehicle, and the U.S. Navy's Office of Naval Research issued a study contract to Douglas for a Mach 7-plus design tentatively designated the D-558-3. Air Force and Navy interest proved crucial to getting the X-15 program off the drawing board and into the air. The next year, 1954, marked the genesis of the X-15. Another NACA study team, headed by John Becker, undertook preliminary design of a Mach 6 rocket-boosted hypersonic research airplane. It had a nickel ally and conal structure, rocket-like four-fin tail, and off-shelf rockets from the Hermes program. Becker's study anticipated many of the X-15's features and encouraged NACA that summer to invite the military services to join with it in developing such an aircraft. In October, they formed the NACA Air Force Navy Research Aircraft Committee, subsequently known as the X-15 Committee. A joint program directive issued on December 23rd gave technical oversight to NACA and design and construction authority to the Air Force. The Navy and Air Force would jointly fund the effort. The Air Force supervised a design competition in 1955 between Bell, Douglas, North American, and Republic. Bell's Robert Woods, who had launched the company's earlier X-1 effort, might reasonably have expected his firm to win since it had already built and flown the X-1, X-2, and X-5. Douglas's Ed Heinemann, with his D-55-8 Skystreak and Skyrocket, plus the D-55-3 study, might have as well. Both companies produce relatively cheap designs, each promising to deliver three airplanes for a total cost of $36 million. Harrison's Stormy Storms, a veteran of North American's many fighter programs, led the design team that drafted his firm's entry at an estimated $56 million, the most expensive proposal. But both Bell and Douglas's designs were considered too technically risky, and Republic's, which was technically insufficient and also more costly than the Bell and Douglas proposals, came in last. Accordingly, despite the huge cost disparity, the Air Force notified North American on September 30th that it had won the competition. On June 11th, 1956, after final negotiations, North American received a $42.9 million contract, about $349 million today, for the three X-15s. Three months later, Reaction Motors Incorporated was awarded with a $10.7 million contract for their engines. The X-15 program involved far more than simply designing a new airplane, however novel it might be. 
its rocket engine, pilot protection system, environmental controls and flight control system, as well as its flight test range, posed complex challenges. The X-15's XLR-99 engine, more than three times as powerful as the X-2's and eight times as powerful as the X-1's, proved particularly risky. Developed by New Jersey-based Reaction Motors, the XLR-99 was based on the earlier XLR-30, used in the Navy's Viking High Altitude rocket program. Any hopes that the Viking experience would help with its design proved illusory. Unlike the XLR-30, which burned diluted alcohol and liquid oxygen, the 57,000-pound thrust XLR-99 burned 1,445 gallons of more explosive anhydrous ammonia and 1,000 gallons of iox. More significant, however, Taikol had to man-rate the engine, i.e. make it safe enough for operation in a piloted airplane, capable of repeated use, and both throttleable and restartable in flight. This was not easy to achieve, particularly as its high-speed turbopump, a potential source of disaster, fed the engine propellants at a rate of 167 pounds per second. Eventually, the XLR-99 became a reliable power plant with a rated operational life of about one hour, about 40 flights before requiring overhaul. Such reliability came at a price for a far longer than anticipated development period compelling North American to complete the first two X-15s with older XLR-11 engines for their proving flights. The X-15 required a complex flight control system, a conventional fighter-like stick controlled an all-moving tail that furnished pitch and roll control, but was used only during approach and landing. During high-G acceleration, climb, and re-entry, the pilot relied on a side stick controller a reaction control system operating small hydrogen peroxide jet thrusters located in the nose and wings furnished pitch, roll, and yaw inputs at high altitudes, where conventional controls were ineffective. Eventually, the third X-15s flew with an adaptive flight control system that automatically compensated for changing dynamic pressure, blending the reactor control system with the conventional aerodynamic controls. Since the X-15 was technically a boost glider, once it exhausted its propellants, the pilot had to carefully manage his energy to ensure he could reach Roger's dry lake. To help him in doing this, the X-15 would always be flown so that it had excess energy at burnout, which the pilot could use his bleed off using large pedal-like speed brakes installed in the side of a massive dorsal and ventral fins. Unlike earlier rocket-powered aircraft that flew near Edwards AFB, the X-15 demanded a special flight test corridor, dubbed the High Range, running roughly 480 miles from Wendover, Utah, southwest to Edwards. Crossing multiple mountain ranges in the stark southwestern desert, the High Range was itself a notable technical accomplishment, foreshadowing the manned spacecraft tracking network NASA established for Project Mercury several years later. NASA furnished two tracking stations at Ely and Beatty, Nevada, as well as at Edwards. Furthermore, unlike research airplanes, the X-15 required a complex flight simulator to train pilots and undertake mission planning and rehearsal. The simulator was updated using data required during X-15 flights, with pilots typically spending 40 to 50 hours in it before undertaking the 10 to 12-minute flight. When the program commenced, it was hoped the X-15 might be flying by the end of 1957. Due to the complexity of its design and technical challenges involved, however, test flights did not begin until 1959. In the interim, NASA and the Air Force supported the X-15 development effort with extensive wind tunnel and free flight ballistic tunnel testing, evaluated reaction controls on ground simulator rigs and unmodified research airplanes including the Bell X-1B and F-104, and undertook extensive simulation studies to prepare for the crucial challenges faced by a hypersonic rocket plane having, for its first time, the lowest lift-to-drag ratio ever flown on a piloted aircraft. In October 1957, Sputnik had seized the public imagination, and the national debate over American science and technology that followed, NACA had given way to the space-focused NASA. Now the X-15 took on greater urgency and visibility as a symbol of America's progression into space. Vice President Richard Nixon presided over its rollout at North American's Los Angeles facility on October 15, 1958, a year after the Soviet satellite ushered in the new space age. It was a remarkable-looking aircraft, burnished metallic black, 
with thin wings and horizontal tail surfaces, and, because of the directional stability requirements of high supersonic and hypersonic flight, large meat cleaver dorsal and ventral vertical fins, the lower half of the ventral surface jettisonable during landing approach so that the X-15 landing skids could be a reasonable size. Although planners had originally thought the X-15 would use a modified Convair B-36 as a mothership, the retirement of the B-36 and the availability of the more powerful and capable B-52A led to its substitution for Convair's giant intercontinental bomber. Early tests with the X-15 proved far from encouraging. Piloted by North American test pilot Scott Crossfield, who had been so dedicated to the project that, as it began, he left NACA for North American, the first X-15 AF-56-6670 made its maiden captive flight on March 10, 1959, followed by its first glide flight on June 8th. During the landing approach, Crossfield encountered serious longitudinal control problems that pushed his piloting skills to the limit, necessitating adjustments to the boosted flight control system. The second X-15, AF-56-6671, made the type's first powered flight on September 17th. Propelled by two XLR-11 engines, it reached Mach 2.11 at 52,341 feet. He completed another powered flight into Mach 2.15 a month later. But then, on November 5th, disaster struck, when an engine fire forced an emergency landing on Rosamond Dry Lake, during which 6,671 broke its back. While the second X-15 returned to North American for repairs and installation of its XLR-99, proving flights continued through 1960, with 6670 still equipped with its interim XLR-11s. The third X-15, AF-56-6672, was the first completed with the big tactical XLR-99. But during an Edwards ground test, the engine blew up catapulting the rest of the airplane forward. Safe in its cockpit, Crossfield marveled at the X-15's strength and worried for the safety of crews trying to extricate him. The plane, like the second X-15, returned to North American for a rebuild. Not until November 15, 1960, three years late, would the X-15 fly with its XLR-99 engine. When Crossfield took 6671 to Mach 2.97, marking the end of its contractor flight test program. But now, the X-15 hits its stride. On March 7, 1961, Air Force Major Robert M. White became the first pilot to exceed Mach 4. He piloted the second X-15 across the hypersonic divide on June 23rd, attaining Mach 5.72. White completed a sonic trifecta by exceeding Mach 6 on November 9th, as previously mentioned. Nor was the boyish airman the X-15's only record-setter. On August 22, 1963, NASA research pilot Joseph Walker attained 354,200 feet in the third X-15, taking it into space. Marring this was a serious landing accident on November 9, 1962, that virtually destroyed the second X-15 and seriously injured NASA pilots Jack McKay. When an engine failure necessitated a heavyweight emergency landing on Mud Lake, 6671 skid landing gear collapsed. Even this setback was turned to advantage, for NASA lengthened the X-15 and added provisions for two huge flop takes and a dummy supersonic combustion ramjet engine installation on the shortened lower vertical fin. Eventually, on October 3, 1967, Major William J. Pete Knight reached Mach 6.7 flying this aircraft, designated the X-15A2. During the flight, unanticipated heating led to multiple structural failures, causing the scramjet module to separate from the aircraft and damaging the fuel jettison system. Knight, a superlative airman, landed safely. Sadly, shortly after Knight's remarkable flight, the fastest by a piloted airplane in the 20th century, Air Force test pilot Major Michael Adams, was killed in the third X-15. On November 15, 1967, during a high-altitude flight, it entered a Mach 5-plus spin, and it broke well above Mach 4, during an inverted dive into the lower atmosphere. The accident stemmed from a fatal combustion of instrumentation and control systems failures, plus human factors. Less than a year later, on October 24, 1968, 
the X-15 completed its last flight, its 199th flown by NASA pilot William Dana. NASA attempted a 200th flight on December 20th, but Edward was in typically swathed in snow. Planners took it as an omen and simply retired the craft. The first X-15 went to the National Air and Space Museum, where it may be seen in the milestones of flight gallery, and the second, the fastest airplane of the 20th century, to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. Altogether, 12 distinguished pilots, Scott Crossfield, Robert White, Forrest Peterson, Neil Armstrong, Joe Walker, Jack McKay, Milt Thompson, Robert Rushworth, Mike Adams, Bill Dana, Pete Knight, and Joe Engel had flown the X-15 to speeds and altitudes never previously achieved by winged vehicles. Its research program consisted of an aerodynamic and structural heating investigation phase from 1959 through 1963, and a follow-on program utilizing the X-15 to carry experiments into the upper atmosphere or to hypersonic speeds. Much of the applications program benefited from the contemporaneous Apollo effort, but it also helped sensor and missile detection efforts. X-15 flights produced more than 700 technical reports, establishing a database still considered essential today, as hypersonics advances into the second century of flight. The X-15 was by no means a perfect research vehicle. Under some circumstances, it had dangerous flight characteristics, and heavy impact loads sorely texted its landing skids. During re-entry, in-flight reconnaissance effects could interact with its flight control system. Early on, Researchers discovered gaps in panels that permitted the entry of hot hypersonic air into its structure, necessitating fixes. Cockpit outer window panels shattered from heat-distorted panel frame structural loads, forcing redesign, and its nose landing gear twice extended in flight due to thermal stress. There were several landing incidents and accidents, one major ground explosion, and, of course, the sad loss of the third X-15 with Mike Adams. But overall, as a product of the pre-computer design era and without the benefit of modern tools such as computational fluid dynamics in computer-aided design and manufacturing, the X-15 constituted a remarkable achievement and an astonishing productive research program bridging the age of flight and the age of space. Fittingly, two of its most distinguished pilots went on to greater fame in the U.S. space program. Neil Armstrong became the first man to walk on the moon, and Joe Engel became one of NASA's first space shuttle mission commanders. Today, Air Force and NASA researchers pursue Mach 6 hypersonic flight with the air-breathing Boeing Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne X-51A Wave Rider Scramjet research vehicle. Tellingly, its designation, X-51, was deliberately chosen and reserved to echo the X-15 and remind researchers of the remarkable aircraft that, a half a century ago, did so much to make hypersonic flight a reality.